Welcome back. This is Now You Know with Sam Hedden. We have a very special guest with us. He's a local musical artist. His name is Dan Israel. He has won awards for his music. He has been doing this for a very long time. He is an outstanding musician, and I'm very excited for you to get to know a little bit more about him. Hi, Dan. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for that nice introduction. Um, I guess I, I do research on everybody that I talk to beforehand, and I saw that for 21 years you worked a desk job. Yeah. What, what's it like to go from a desk job to a full-time musician? Can you tell us a little bit about how that happened and like what that is like? Yeah, well, I started doing that kind of work, like legislative proofreading, basically editing and proofreading for the legislature. I started doing that when I lived in Austin, Texas, in the early 90s. And then when I, I grew up here in the Twin Cities, and when I moved, I moved back here in the mid 90s. And it's just kind of like I ended up finding a similar kind of job here, but I stayed there. Uh, you might say I got trapped there, but uh, I, 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 you know, somehow there were times where, when it was really difficult uh, to balance everything. Um, and I always tried to downplay the effect that the music part of my life, see, because I didn't stop making music when I had that job. I just kind of plowed full speed ahead through having a day job and then having kids and commuting across town from St. Louis Park to St. Paul every day. It was kind of, I like to call it the perfect storm for a, for a breakdown in your forties. And that's pretty much what happened to me. <laughs> I, I kind of lost it you know um a lot of things happened at once but i just don't think i could have stayed i mean some things came together in my life to enable me to leave the job but even had those not think if had those things not come together you know i had some good fortune strike a little bit and a couple things like that but it had that not happened i still can't see how i would have been able to stay at the legislature um because it was just like it was when i say it was a constant struggle I mean, maybe not for everybody else there, but for me, it was. It was. It was always this tension between my two lives or my five lives. I have put out 15 albums. My 15th album is the one that came out in 2019, Social Media Anxiety Disorder. Kind of a strange name for an album, but I was trying to look for a title that sort of represented how I felt about the times we're living in. I, I've had a lot more time in the last couple of years to write songs, so I sort of had this bumper crop of songs that I was really excited about. So early in 2019, I went into two new studios, two uh, producers I hadn't worked with before, John Herkert and Steve Price, and they each did about half the songs on social media anxiety disorder. It was sort of intensive, like I spent a lot of days uh, working on this album and really fine tuning it. And a lot of people have said they think it's the best sounding record I've ever made. I've been traveling on this one hour road, trying just to get along. Hardly know who I am sometimes, but let's get it down in the song. Wandering nameless is so long now Keep wondering who I'm gonna be I'm almost out of it, got no doubt of it But it might as well be me Always something I'm supposed to be doing Giving up, staying ahead Always a reason for me to be stewing Sick and tired of bleeding, I bled I'm ready to head out in any direction Promises to keep me free Almost out of it, got no doubt of it, but it might as well be me. From the articles I read, you were also a father. So how do you manage handling your family life and being a full-time musician? Because as great as that sounds, I imagine there's still a lot of work that goes into that. It's, it's a lot sometimes. I mean, now, it was a lot before March, you know, mid-March of 2020, because now it's a different kind of a lot you know um it's a lot of being home together and not running around driving doing all the 
my kids take, you know, my daughter has dance class all the time, you know, all these things that I'm not doing now that, I mean, sure. I, I'm glad my kids were busy, but it was also uh, a lot to keep up with. So I don't want to be that person who says, thank God for the coronavirus. <laughs> you know, like I'm not going to say that it's inflicted a lot of pain on a lot of people and myself included in some ways, you know, it's just, it's, it's shifted a lot of dynamics. I think it's fair to say that without necessarily weighing in on whether that's a good or bad thing. It's just changed a lot. Coming into this time of year is always when I'm looking ahead to summer. And summer's the big season for what I do, right? I mean, especially like band, like full band shows. We get our biggest shows in the summer. You're looking forward all year basically in Minnesota to this one little window of time for four lousy months that you can be outside that you can play outside, that you can have festivals, all this stuff. And to come into all that and then suddenly start to see it all crumble, just as it would normally be coming together. Because I put together that summer schedule usually every year, you know, February to April. So at the exact same time that normally I'd be getting all excited about it, it all fell apart. And uh, that sucked. And that, that there's no sugarcoating that it just sucks. I don't know what all I would have been playing. I didn't have my whole schedule together yet, but it's, it's our big season, you know? So to lose that is essentially in some ways to kind of lose the year 2020 a little bit, not to over dramatize it, but it is a little bit because it's, it's peak season. It's like retailers losing Christmas, you know? So I think, um, in that sense, it seemed devastating. Now, what's happened since that's dawned on me and many other people is, you know, the recognition that this isn't going to go away in five minutes. It's not going to go away in five days, five weeks, or maybe even five months. So you have to try to do everything you can to adapt and to make the new situation work. Did I think I'd be like spending my weeks planning for my one live stream show from my living room once a week no but that that's kind of what I'm doing a lot of the time I'm like hunting around for my old songs to revive learn my new ones but find covers that are interesting and fun and people can get enjoyment out of I'm trying to bring a little light you know into my own life and everybody else's once a week by having little live stream shows I mean I've seen people say well it's not the same well of course it's not the same we we what, what, what choice do we have but to do those? So, you know, I mean, that's, that's the only, and then for me, the other thing that was, I don't know if it was, uh, I, I don't know whether I could say it's a good or bad thing. I'm just going to, I just know what happened is that I had another record ready to put out this year. And so now I'm putting it out. I'm putting out my new album uh, kind of in the, this vacuum of, you know, no ability to do a, a release show, but I see other people doing it too. And I think it's kind of a good thing. Like, I guess what I'm saying is I debated whether to delay it, to wait, you know, and it's like, why, what, what, wait for what? Like, well, we maybe even this would be a good time for us, for you to tell us a little bit about the music that you play. Who are some of the sure. people that have influenced you? Some of like the artists who are inspirations to you yeah. and the type of music that you really focus on. Well, God, I'm, I'm, see, I'm a total, like, throwback, uh, like, it's very disappointing to people sometimes when they talk to me about music, and I don't mention any music created in the last 30 years, <laughs> but that, get used to it, that, it doesn't mean I don't like any music created in the last 30 years, there's stuff I like, but where I'm really enthused, I still might, the focus of my enthusiasm still tends to be 60s, 70s, 80s, kind of, like, sometimes 40s and 50s, sometimes 90s and 00s, but the heart, the sweet spot for me is still that golden era of rock and roll because I haven't even listened to all of it yet. I mean, and I'm not a very adventurous listener, I admit it, but I know what I like and I, I do take in new things or new old things very often, new old things, things from the past that I never listened to before. But, um, you know, to the, I'm still kind of like anchored in the Bob Dylan Beatles school of songwriting, which is to me doesn't mean that only thing I listen to is Bob Dylan and the Beatles, but I'm just saying as a 
guideposts for me, what I'm always trying to achieve, strive towards, you know, that's kind of like my ideal still, like the pinnacle of songwriting to me happened in that era. Has music always been like your passion or was it something that kind of happened over time? It, it was a passion that I didn't quite know early on I was going to follow. Like as a kid, I knew I had a sense that I would end up in some kind of art or performing or something like that or writing. Like I was a creative weirdo kid. Um, not, I was very mainstream weirdo, you know, I never like was a delinquent or if I was, I got away with it by kind of, being a good boy in lots of parts of my life. <laughs> I probably should have gotten in more trouble is what I'm trying to say. But I also was good at not getting caught. Okay, that's a skill, right? Um, that's, that's a type of skill. That's, that's a skill, um, yes. That's, yeah, that's a skill. That's a skill. But um, I was always into music and music runs in my family. My grandmother, my mom's mom was a concert pianist. My dad's dad played in the Catskills, like, uh, you know, the Borscht Belt, they call it. He played in a band where in those resorts in New York where the the Jews weren't allowed to go to the Gentile resorts. They opened their own resorts, and that was called the Borscht Belt. And it ended up being where, like, a huge number of television, comedy, and music stars started out in the Borscht Belt. Pretty much a who's who of anybody you probably ever heard of from the 50s, 60s, 70s, who, at least who was Jewish, probably cut their teeth playing music or doing comedy in that so this stuff kind of ran in my family is what i'm saying you know performing music and it was all around me growing up and then i gravitate you know my parents had a lot of records but i listened to the radio and i i got really into american top 40 with casey Kasem every sunday night that countdown i was like you know when i go back and look at what were hits when i was a kid i still love those songs like the top 40 a lot of it was crap but a lot of it was great now i don't you know i don't listen to the top 40 but i'm just saying it was an exciting thing for me and i got i got really into it and then i i was forced to play piano as a kid um you know but i liked it i liked it but i at age 12 i switched over to guitar i'd played piano taken lessons for six years switched to guitar um took like group lessons at first then i had private lessons and I got an electric guitar and I started to form bands and you know it was all over for me then I mean like that was going to be you know I th well I, okay I went through a little bit of up and down with it I guess through my teen years where I, I think I thought I was going to be a movie ma a director and or I was going to be a sportscaster you know there are all these things that were more tv film oriented that I thought I might do but um I went to college to for film at Northwestern in Chicago. But while I was there, I just started to write my own songs a lot more. And it just happened. I was away from home and I kind of maybe was experimenting with some psychedelic drugs, things like that. But I, I kind of found that I really liked to be alone and write. Um, no, I mean, but that was part of it. I'm not gonna, you know, that's part of the cliched college experience. But for me, it was actually kind of meaningful at times. Yeah. Uh, you know, and um, I just found that that's what I, that would became like my calling, you know, but then I got out of college and it's like, how the hell do I make a living playing music? I started to wait tables and do that kind of thing. And the economy sucked in 92. I know this makes me sound old, but I graduated college in 92 and the economy, we were in a recession. I couldn't really get a good job. And so I, I kind of hopped around the upper Midwest. I moved to Madison, Wisconsin for a month. I worked like 14 different jobs in 1992. That's not, I mean, that doesn't even sound that weird now, but then that was weird. I really was like itinerant in 1992. I had a big breakup. I moved three times and I ended up moving back to Minneapolis. And then I moved to Austin, Texas. And that's where I like landed post college. And I formed a band there called um, Potter's Field. And we made like my first album was made there my first cd you know i had demo tapes but that's when i really started like really going for it was in austin or 92 to 95 i lived there and i mean there's people you know stop 500 people in the music scene in austin on the street you know 15 20 of them might remember me <laughs>
I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't know. That might 15, be 20. That's pretty good. I mean, considering. Yeah, that, from the 90s. I mean, I made, I made a little impact, but it would be more, I think it'd be more fair to say it was with nowadays, only people who would remember me were people in the scene. You know, I wasn't like mm-hmm. some huge star or anything, but I, I made a bit of a mark there. And then the band broke up. Um, I had moved there with a guy from college. We moved into a house together and then it's like a soap opera. There was a whole cataclysmic band breakup, which is not the first or last time I've been through that. And I um, went solo for a little while in Austin, but then I saw some Minneapolis bands playing down there at South by Southwest. I saw like, you know, Soul Asylum was on a huge roll then. This is early 90s, the runaway train era. And the Jayhawks had put out um, Tomorrow the Green Grass. And I saw them together playing down there. And the Honey Dogs came down. And I was like, why am I in Austin? That This is not the kind of music. I, I'm i more the kind of music that comes from my hometown. Like more pop, you know, a little bit more, less country, you know, a little bit more rock and a little less country. Dylan, Prince, all the stuff that comes from here is so song oriented, but in a, maybe not so much in Dylan's case, but you know, in a, in a guitar rock pop kind of way, just a little different approach, a little less of that Texas country music influence. And now I like that. Now I like that. But when I lived there, God, I, 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 I was so over it when I lived there. I was like, why are you people so into this boring country music now? Now I have a greater appreciation for it. And I watched the Ken Burns series and I mean, I'm fascinated by it and I've come to like a lot of it, but I have to tell you, I was the, I'm always the contrarian. So when I lived in Austin, I was the guy who hated country music. Maybe now I'm the guy who likes it more than everyone here. But. far as where to find my music sometimes i just tell people to google me because it's it's the easiest thing is just to type dan israel i guarantee you even without without quotes or putting music you're gonna find a lot of my stuff but i do have a band camp page soundcloud and if you can get to all those links in general by going to my website i still have a traditional website which is dan israel music.com dan israel music all one thing.com um, and remember, I'm I S R A E L. Even though everybody wants to always call me Dan Israel, it's Ale Israel. 
uh, you know, 15 albums on Spotify seem to be 16 or something like that. There might be one that isn't up there, but pretty, pretty much a lot of my music out there on YouTube. We have lots of videos, official videos and, you know, more casual stuff, but we've made music videos. Uh, there's a, there's a double digit number of, of like real music videos now on, on YouTube. Um, and then if you really wanted to get obsessive, you could just Google me, you know, if you've got, you all have time. So just spend days, weeks of your life reading articles about me, um, watching my Minnesota original thing, the TPT almanac, you know, you can find, if you want to be enterprising, there's, there's <laughs> all kinds of ephemera out there if you really want to be an obsessive fan, but. Uh, well, you're not wrong. I figured that out very quickly. So. Don't stalk my, my personal house and uh, if you can find me, don't leave me alone. No, just kidding. <laughs> so anyway, thank you though. I mean, thank I've kind of had a, the last year has been good, even despite all what's going on now, there's been a little bit of increase in visibility. The last album was kind of made some noise a little bit. So good. You know, That's good to hear. There's no predicting the music business, but no. Don't try. That that's one thing you should never predict. <laughs> you guys got to meet the amazing Dan Israel. He's a very talented musical artist. He's been all over. Sixteen albums, and you can find them, most of them, on Spotify. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Sam Hedden with producer Andy Watson. And now you know Dan Israel. <laughs> <laughs> or you can do it your way first and then you can do it my way. Oh, I mean, we'll just shut see which up. Is <laughs>